group, you know, in AB that we just have so, so many acronyms and we're going to break down two special ones today, ACES and TIF. We're going to focus on TIF 2.0 and we're really going to give you some strategies and some lessons that are available now on the Atlas website to use in your classroom. My name is Carly Voschel. I wear a couple different hats in ABE. I uh, work with digital literacy students at uh, 622, which is Harmony Learning Center in Maplewood. And then I have um, joined the Atlas team in August of 2023, and I am the transitions coordinator. All right, and my name is Stephanie Summers, and I work for Minneapolis Adult Education. And before Carly stepped into this role, and um, it's kind of an expanded role at Atlas, um, I was the ACES coordinator, and I worked together with my Minneapolis colleague, Heather Turngren, to do a lot of the TIFF 2.0 work, which is what we really want to be sharing today for the most part. So Carly uh, invited me to participate today and help to lead some of this discussion, and I am so happy to be here. Thank you. So let's see, what are we going to talk about today? Here is our agenda. We're going to start with just a quick overview of what is ACES, what is TIFF, and then we're going to get into the three categories for today. There's six categories total for ACES TIFF. We're going to focus on these three, effective communication, learning strategies, and critical thinking. If you'd like to learn more about the other three categories, we're going to have another webinar in February. We'll have more information about that later. This is going to be really interactive. You're going to be able to share in the chat or unmute and you know, we can talk through some of these things. We're going to get to try some of the teaching strategies, um, but we do have a specific time at the end for any feedback because we do have that next webinar coming up and then we'll just kind of wrap up at 2.30. So I'm going to start with just um, breaking down this alphabet soup um, because I know we have a lot of different acronyms and actually ACEs um, there's another, if you come from like a social work background, there's actually another acronym called ACES um, that we're not going to be talking about. In this context, ACES is the Academic Career and Employability Skills. So this is one of our three Minnesota ABE content standards. And then what is the TIFF? The TIFF is the Transition Integration Framework. So this is a document that categorizes and organizes the, um, the skills. And this next slide shows a graphic of all six of the categories. Again, we're only going to talk about three of them today. But hopefully when you look at the different categories, you recognize some of these things that are happening in your classroom, no matter what level you're teaching in ABE, if you're working with IET or Adult Career Pathways, or even beginning ESL, right, at all of these levels. What I hear from educators is they look at these categories and they're like, yeah, I'm doing that stuff. And what we're going to spend time on today is not like stop doing what you're doing, do this, but just, oh, here's a little tweak to that. Or, hey, have you ever thought about this? When I see these different categories, I think, okay, well, maybe I'm kind of heavily relying on a few of them. I could do more with effective communication or self-management or something like that. But really, in general, throughout the state, we really are acing it, you guys. We're really utilizing those skills and strategies in our classrooms at all level. So the ACES TIF was adopted by Minnesota ABE in 2016. And if you think about, you know, a few years back, it was kind of time to get a few changes and a few revisions. And that's exactly what happened in 2023. And Stephanie and Heather um, from Minneapolis ABE were a part of those revisions. And the idea was we just need the ACES TIF to better reflect what's currently happening in ABE. A lot had changed, right? So I'm not gonna read these um, entire revisions here, but 
there's themes or just kind of realities that um, are happening now that maybe we didn't hear as much about in 2016, such as diversity, equity, inclusion, social and emotional learning. You know, in 2016, I wasn't teaching online or Stephanie just finished a class um, this afternoon, which is high flex. We've got teachers in ABE around the state who are teaching in these new um, using new platforms and the ACES TIF was revised to uh, account for that. And then also we're doing a lot more in ABE with integrated education and training, IET work and workforce preparation. And those themes have been further incorporated into the TIF. So we're going to cover a lot today in this hour and a half, but there's always um, an opportunity to learn more about ACES TIF after you leave this webinar. And I wanted to share a few of those resources. So one great um, resource with a lot of different topics is the Minnesota ABE YouTube page. So any of the webinars that are recorded, once they're recorded and um, saved, they go up on the YouTube channel. What I want to point out with this graphic is that there was a series of three webinars last year called Tifty Tuesday. You know, we love our clever sayings in ABE, so that was a cute one. Um, there were three webinars that really focused on that TIF 2.0, so those would be a great resource if you want to learn more. And like you can see from this graphic, it's an hour and a half, so it could be a great um, thing to show at a consortium meeting, or maybe a teacher PD day, or another opportunity where you want to do some learning in small groups or on your own, you can check out that YouTube page and look for those Tifty Tuesday webinars. Um, I also have a link here to the Atlas website where we have ACES and transition resources, videos, toolkits, things like that. Um, then I also wanted to mention that uh, there is an ACES TIF Foundation course. It's something that Stephanie put together from the Schoology course, and now I am the facilitator of that. Um, there's a link that we're sharing here that will give you registration information, how to register for the course, how to get to it on Canvas. And then if you complete the course, you will earn six CEUs. This could be a great um, course for somebody new to ABE, or maybe you're not new to ABE, but you're new to some of this transition work. Um, or it could be a refresher. I know for myself, maybe six, seven years ago, I got some tra training on ACEs and then I didn't really refresh much on it. So kind of coming back, using this course to go through some of the modules or all of them, that could be a great fit to learn more. And I'm gonna pass it to Stephanie now. All right. Thank you for going over all of that kind of history and background information with us, Carly. I think it's so useful to kind of remember the evolution of ACES TIF and uh, where we started and where we've where we've evolved to, um, and for sharing those resources. As Carly said, um, last year in particular. Uh, my focus as the then ACES coordinator was to try to talk about some of the changes, um, some of the ways in which we were updating these lesson plans and some of the areas of special focus that we had decided to include. And so the three webinars that we did last year in that Tifty Tuesday series, one of them in particular focused on DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. And we had some great experts who actually are from outside of Minnesota ABE. So they're voices that we don't hear from all the time. Uh, Sudi Whalen, who works for Lynx and has developed a whole course over there on DEI, she spoke. Um, and so that would be a great one to check out. We also had a webinar specifically devoted to um, SEL or social emotional learning. 
Um, and a Minnesota presenter, Andrea Eckelberger, she presented on some of the work she's done around trauma-informed instruction, which people always really uh, love to hear about. And then our third webinar was related to differentiation um, and sort of making these TIF skills, what they can look like in a variety of different classrooms. And so I would encourage people to check those out if you have an interest in learning more about any of those topics. And this year, when Carly and I started talking about what the webinar should look like, uh, we decided that what we really would like to do now is kind of dig into these uh, categories and, and in particular, the new lesson plans and some of the activities from those lesson plans. So last year, we were sort of uh, still building our plane as we were trying to fly it. And we had some of the lesson plans finished, some of them were in various draft stages. And so we weren't ready to share them all in their entirety last winter. Now they are all finished, they're all available linked to the Atlas website. And so it's really, an exciting opportunity to kind of dig into these and show you what great resources they are. So first we're gonna talk about effective communication. And if you would go to the next slide. So just to kind of remind us all what effective communication means within our TIFF framework. Effective communication is a two-way process between individuals of diverse backgrounds and experience in which information is conveyed and received in ways that are mutually understood as intended. This can in include speaking, writing, and all forms of nonverbal communication. Examples of activities in this category could include adjusting communication to suit various audiences, questioning to clarify meaning and to enhance understanding, or articulating differences and appreciating how differences can affect communication. Teaching the skills in this category will help the learner give and receive information in a purposeful, appropriate, and collaborative manner. So that is our category. And if we go to the next slide, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the three skills. So in the TIFF framework, every category has a definition, then we have main skills, and then we have sub skills. And so the three main skills in effective communication are engage positively and actively with individuals in both one-on-one -on -one and team settings to accomplish goals. Util excuse me, use language, style, level of formality, and nonverbal cues appropriate to context and task in oral and written communication, and utilize a variety of technologies for communication. So these are our various uh, main skills. And then if we go to the next slide, here we see sort of the complete list of skills, including the sub skills. So one of the things we like to do when we use ACES, our TIFF framework as a planning tool for our own instruction is as Carly mentioned earlier, kind of think about what are some of the skills in this category you already work on a lot with your students? And then what are some areas where you maybe could do more or pay a little more attention to developing those skills? So I'd like you to look at this list and you could maybe share in the chat one thing that you think you're doing well and one thing that might need more attention. And the way that we usually would share these would be with the number and then the letter. So if I, if I think I'm doing a good job of helping my students repair communication breakdowns respectfully and effectively, I would type 1B, okay? So let's take a moment and think about what do we feel like we're doing well, or maybe what are skills your students already demonstrate and what are some areas where you think you could maybe pay some more attention in helping your students develop their skills? I'd love to see some people use the chat to share out.
So I, I'll start. I One of my roles in my program is adult diploma coordinator. And one of the things I often have to work on with my students is skill 2B, the choose appropriate register. So when my students are writing their uh, essay for their diploma portfolio, I often need to work with them on creating a more consistent formal tone. And we've got some other people. So Heather is saying she teaches online. So 3A about evaluating and using appropriate technology is something she, work, she works on. And 2A, recognize, oh, sure. Yeah, when our students, when we don't see each other every day, it can be hard to work on those gestures and body language. Carly agrees with 3A. I shared mine to be Kelly says um, one E. Okay, participate and make contributions. That's something you're doing well. Yeah, that's great. So it sounds like you're saying your students are comfortable um, speaking up in class and maybe um, working together in groups, but they need to work on the appropriate tone and register. Great. And we've got Julie saying TB, 2B. She makes sure she works into, um, oh, excuse me, I misspoke. 3B is about employing protocols, okay. And 2B is about level of formality. And 2B is what Julie says she works on with her students, even from the beginning level. That is great, Julie. Maybe later when we share out how we're using these skills, you could share how you do that. I'm sure people would love to know some of your routines or activities for developing that skill at the beginning level. That can sometimes be a challenge. We've got a few people saying they do 1A. I think that's what they're doing well. 3A is something that uh, Heather or Amanda as one of our uh, one of our program specialists around uh, remote uh, instruction, remote learning um, is doing well, and she struggles with 2C intonation. Okay, great, great, great. Thank you for sharing. So uh, if you're a teacher who's new to ACES TIFF, this is sort of the process we go through. We can look at these skills just like we would with any um, set of skills or competencies. We think about what our students are already doing well, and then we look for the gaps. And that's how we start to choose some skills we particularly like to work on. And then we can develop our lessons and activities around that. Okay. So 3C, use, use of technology for social norms. Yes, I will say, as the mother of two teenagers in my house, we need a lot of work on that because uh, we've recently been arguing a great deal with my my son, who's a junior in high school, about trying to explain why if he's uh, watching his video, watching videos or watching uh, YouTube on his phone, and also if he's got his Xbox on in the background and he's in a chat uh, chain with his friends, why maybe he's not fully focusing on his homework, right? Because that's not really a norm for studying is to also be doing a bunch of other stuff. So yeah, I think that's one we do have to work on. Okay, great. Great for kicking us off. Thank you for your active participation. Let's go to the next slide. So here's what I'm so excited for us to really uh, spend a little bit of time doing. There are three great lesson plans that are available for every category of the TIFF. So we've got six categories, three lesson plans. That's 18 ready to use lesson plans that have been um, reviewed, peer reviewed. At least one lesson from each category was peer reviewed by our ACES TIFF advisory team and gave us feedback. We would love to get more feedback from users who start using these in the field. So if you use one of these lessons and you'd like to tell us what, what really works or what might need to be tweaked, we'd love to get that feedback. What we'd like you to do right now 
is we'd like you to choose the lesson plan that um, that works with your level of students. So we've got a beginning lesson plan about understanding gestures and greetings. We've got an intermediate level lesson plan about recognizing levels of formality and an advanced lesson plan about recognizing effective teamwork. So think about your students. Okay, so Kelly, if you're advanced, then when you click on the link that Patsy chatted out, which I think is gonna take you to a Google folder, you'll see there are there's one for advanced, one beginning and one intermediate. These are all Google kind of available um, being shared through Google Drive. So then Kelly, you would click on the advanced level plan. I'd like you to open that up, okay? And then I'd like us to spend maybe, um, let's say, let's spend the next four minutes or so, review, just kind of give that a, a good skim through of the plan, okay? And let's, so now that we know where to go, can you go to the next slide, Harley? So these are kind of the questions. We're gonna spend a few minutes looking at the plans and think about these questions. What do you like about this lesson? What activities could you use with your students? So maybe it's not the whole lesson, but there's one or two activities that you really like the look of. And is there anything that wouldn't work and that would need to be changed for you to use it? So let's spend the next, let's say four minutes looking at the plans and thinking about these questions and then we'll share out in the chat, okay?
All right. So that's that's been about three and a half minutes, maybe. Um, and I love that Kelly, um, who I think was going to look at the advanced lesson, which is about teamwork, that she mentions in the chat. She loved the sections um, that talk about um, speaking, comp like sharing your personal opinions and that um, there is a section with a realistic video. Um, and she feels like it fits, I think this is a great comment, it fits with her eager age group of students who are super new to the country, like 20 to 30 years old. So um, sounds like you're finding some things that might be useful. Um, and we're going to actually watch one of the videos from that series coming up here in just a minute. So everyone will get to kind of see what you're talking about. Okay. Um, okay. And then Kelly is saying one of the, the difficult time things about using this lesson might be she doesn't have space for group work. Um, okay. So you might have to reevaluate either how to do the group work or maybe think about um, alternative ways to structure the group work. Okay. Amanda looked at the beginning activity. Okay. And, and students stand up when they hear hello in their language. And then if they're comfortable writing on the board, Amanda is um, a lead orientation teacher in our program, so she's thinking this might be a nice way to um, acknowledge people's backgrounds and um, when they come in for orientation. And that it might also be a nice way to help students feel comfortable, kind of setting the stage for people feeling comfortable and welcomed right away. That's great. Heather says she looked at the advanced lesson and she liked um, how it talks about how it might be used either or in person or high flex. And then also how it gives students some language around how to turn down a suggestion, like, uh, you know, in a, in a polite way, like, oh, that sounds like a great idea, but um, good. Thank you for sharing some of your specific things that you enjoy. And Julie says she loves that the beginning lesson starts with student language and culture and then moves into English. It's very affirming. So similar to what Amanda said. It also allows for students to see commonalities with those from other cultures and builds community. Yes. So I think, and this is probably what both Julie and Amanda were getting at. I think when it's it's such a hard um kind of a scary thing for students to walk into a classroom, especially maybe students who've never been in an American classroom before. Maybe you feel like you're going to be the only one who doesn't understand or can't follow along with the teacher. And so when we create that sense of shared community, um, that can be so wonderful for students. And I want to say Julie Rasmussen, welcome. Julie and I used to work together. Julie probably doesn't remember this, but I went and observed some of worked with Julie when I was earning my master's degree at the U. So Julie is partly responsible for me having gotten my start in adult ed in Minnesota. So thank you, Julie. All right, great. Thank you. And one of my big goals again in planning this webinar today was just to get folks really digging into these lesson plans. So I want you to see what's there and maybe create some energy around them and maybe you'll share them with others at your work. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna just look a little more closely at one of the activities. This is from the intermediate lesson plan. Okay, um, you can go ahead and get set up, Harley. Um, so this activity comes from the introduction, introduction section of the lesson. Students watch a video and it's from a series called Skills to Pay the Bills. And this series was actually put out by the uh, Department of Labor. And it's specifically meant to help sort of younger people who are kind of bridging maybe from um, into the world of work and developing some of those work skills. 
So this one is called communication. Another one is called teamwork. Um, and so these are great little videos. In the lesson, the students um, watch the video and then answer some questions. There's a worksheet that's included. In your classroom, you could, I think, use the video in a number of different ways. And it really does a great job of helping students start to think about levels of formality, okay? So let's watch this video and then we'll think about how we might be able to use it with our students. Hi, HRU. What? <laughs> WC, uh, QQ. W-O-Y-T? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> R-O-T-F-L-O-L. J-K. F-D-O-J. Uh, what you got? Oh, tuna and coffee. G-G-M-S-O-T. $5.95. Hi, M-I-H-U? Uh, what? <sighs> Y-G-T-B-K-M. W-O-Y-T? Uh, I have no idea what you're saying. What you got there? Oh. I've got three burgers, fries, chocolate shake, and ice cream. Well, IMHO, that's just TMF. <laughs> I mean, OMG, $11.95. T.Y. Uh, may I have a word with you for a moment, Lydia? NP. Lydia, you've got to stop speaking in text. Uh, the customers don't know what you're saying, and they've been complaining. I mean, do you always talk like this? Um, IDK. What? I mean, I don't know. Maybe I do. Um, UTITM? You think it's too much? Yeah, I do. I mean, communication skills are essential for this job, for any job. It's the top of the must-have list for every employer. And I'm your employer. <laughs> Did I make myself clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Hi, HRU. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> May I help you? Yes, I have a chef salad. Good communication skills are important for everyone. You need skills for both communicating information to others and receiving information from others. If you and your employer communicate well with each other, you'll have a much better chance of keeping your job and maybe even getting a promotion. To find out more, just log on to the website Uh, oops. All right. So um, again, the you know, if you're interested in looking at this whole video series, it's called Skills to Pay the Bills. Okay. Um, and they do have actually, a, I think it's like a six video series. And then there are also some lesson plans um, that they have developed or, uh, for e practicing each of these different skills. They're all soft skills. Okay. So what did you think about that video? Do you think it's something your students might enjoy? Uh, if we go to the next slide. Oops, no righty. Could you think of um, ways that you might be able to use the video with your students? And what are some other examples of activities that you could do to practice recognizing levels of formality, register and tone, or other effective communication skills with your students? So um, I'll give people kind of a minute to think, but um, okay. Kelly says she thinks her students would find the video funny. Mm-hmm. Yes, I know when we were watching the video, when we were getting ready for the webinar, we were all kind of laughing. Um, Casey says, yes, she agrees. And how might you be able to, so if students find it funny, that means they're gonna kind of engage with it. What could be some things you might do with the video if you think about showing it to your students or do you have other activities that you sometimes use with your students to practice these skills? 
Let's see. And Heather says, for online students, we could focus on using le less text language, such as LOL or TY in the chat, and more formal language that could be transferred to speaking or email. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, because even though we want our students to be comfortable in class, and we want it to feel like their community, um, while there's certainly a time and a place for using things like LOL or BRB. I think we can also use those as learning tools and say, okay, we also want to be modeling and practicing using more academic or formal language, even within our classroom community. And so we could be practicing that in the chat. So if a student says TY, we might ask, can you think of a more formal way or um, a more a professionally appropriate way to, to express that idea. One of my students, no matter what, so she, she messages me through Remind, which is an app we use for communication. She'll ask me a question and no matter what my response, she responds with the letter K all the time, just a K. And sometimes I think if you were at work and responding to your boss that way, what would they think, right? So that's another example of a time when I could teach more about levels of formality. And Casey says um, she notices with her writing students, sometimes they forget they are not texting, right? And I think sometimes for maybe new students who are newer to the US, maybe they honestly don't know that that's not how everyone talks or speaks. And they might um, really be surprised to learn that there are more formal ways of expressing those ideas. Oh, and Kelly says to introduce the video, maybe she'd start out only talking to them like the girl in the video does and kind of see how they react. How does that go over for them? Can they understand her? Um, another Kelly says, it's easy to see the language register is inappro inappropriate, but explaining why would be revealing, right? So the the especially when we're, you know, we talk about cross-cultural communication or intergenerational communication, that lady's customers were just not understanding what she was trying to say. The video can catch their attention and maybe be a way to um, get into a little bit more um, academic or serious lesson on this topic. Uh-huh. Um, Carly says you could use this and students could role play formal versus informal. Mm -hmm. And Heather says, when I taught ELL in person, we would do a text to academic language chart on the wall to support using academic language in the classroom. Yes, having those language charts, um, posters to remind us our great visual cues in our classroom. Thanks, Heather. And we've got could do a sort of oh could do a sort a sorting activity with different phrases to practice. Um, so like less formal and more formal, and could practice translating from less formal to more or text lingo to more formal email or spoken language. Yes, I will say um, read write think has a nice lesson on this where it looks at written communication and there's an email that someone sends to their boss and a lot of it is text language and the task for students is to rewrite the e email to make it more appropriate for work. So that's one that you could look up and use. Again, that's read, write, think um, and it's about levels of formality. Yep, and then asking them, that's a great one too. So in your culture, do you have um, abbreviations or things that you say, ways of communicating that are considered less formal um, and talking about that to bring in that multicultural perspective? That's great. Ah, okay, and Julie's saying that even though ELLs may not really understand the text speak, maybe they've not gotten into texting like that, um, you could focus on how the manager handled the situation. What did she say? How do you handle someone being culturally inappropriate? Right, so big picture, 
we understand that this woman is at work and her boss is giving her um, direction or redirecting her to behave in a different way. And you could just focus on their interaction. So kind of, that's a great example of how, even though this video comes from the intermediate level lesson, we could maybe um, scaffold it for lower level students by just focusing on a specific part of it. Did you understand um, what the supervisor was saying? Why was she upset with the teacher, or excuse me, with the with the worker? Oh, okay. And Heather bringing in another section from the TIFF, one of our other categories, um, talking about this, showing this video might be a great thing to include in a customer service class. Um, or a class where you work on customer service or hospitality type skills um, for developing a future pathway. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much for sharing all of your wonderful ideas. And we are going to continue now to our next category of focus today, which is learning strategies. Um, so let's go on. And I won't read this one this time. I'll give you a moment to read about learning strategies and what, what that definition means. So I sometimes describe learning strategies as success skills or student skills. They're things that make us good learners, independent learners. Um, the last sentence, teaching the skills in this category will help learners work with and understand new material more independently. So these are kind of those lifelong learning skills, we might say. All right. Let's look at what the specific skills are. So we've got four main skills here. Skill one is apply appropriate strategies for comprehending oral or written language in text and listening activities. Skill two is apply appropriate stat strategies to organize, retain, and review materials in order to aid in understanding and recall. Skill three is apply appropriate strategies to compensate for and fill in gaps in knowledge. And then skill four, articulate awareness of what helps one learn language and content. So it's being able to say it's helpful for me when we watch a video with my students often remind me it's helpful for me when we watch videos if you turn on the closed captioning so I can read along and that's a great reminder to me and it's great that they're able to tell me what they need okay let's go to the next slide so again let's take a moment there's a lot of sub skills here so let's look through this and I'm going to ask you to think about what skills you've, you already think you do a pretty nice job of incorporating and or that you, you've seen your students demonstrate on a pretty regular basis and what could use more attention. I noticed someone previously was using plus or minus signs. So you could do that. You could type in the, the skill and sub skill with a plus or minus next to it if you'd like. So plus would mean it's going well and minus might mean an area for improvement. I will say for myself, when I look at these, one thing I don't do well enough, I think, is skill 2D. I kind of come back a lot in my class. I'll come back and say, okay, we learned this last week. We're going to come back to something we did last week. But I've never really gone over with my students things like using flashcards or specific strategies if they want to review content outside of class. And that would be a good thing for me to do. 
Carly says something that she does well or her students do well is using graphic organizers. Great. Aaron is saying 1A through C as well as E and F. So lots of many of the categories under one, she's doing well, but one D and one G. So making inferences and identifying main idea. That's one we always need to practice, isn't it? Heather's got a lot that she's doing well under skill one and two B. Oh, okay. So she's saying sometimes it's, she gives her students their graphic organizer, but they don't necessarily select which one would be appropriate to use. Yeah. So you're kind of at the stage where they can fill it out if given to them, but they couldn't tell you what they've not practiced selecting one for themselves. And Kelly says, I'm good with all of skill one, not so great with anything in skill four, and that needs improvement. Okay. 3A to 1C. Awesome, Amanda. Okay, very good. Oh, I'm sorry. I misread that. 3A needs to be stronger. Okay, so um, ask for repetition. Okay, yeah. And 1C is something you're doing really well. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, good, good. So thank you for reflecting on that and looking at these skills with me. Now we're going to do the same thing we did before. If we go to the next slide, I'll introduce the three levels. So for learning strategy, the first, the beginning level plan, uh, help students develop their strategies to fill in gaps in knowledge, okay? It uses a particular um, strategy called circumlocation. Um, so students get opportunities to practice with that. For the intermediate level, it's active reading as a strategy to specifically to try to improve test taking, okay? And then the advanced level has to do with developing a growth mindset. So if you click on the link that Patsy shared, you'll again come to three folders. Let's again spend maybe four minutes looking at these different um, three different lessons. I'm going to set a timer and then we will, if we go to the next slide, there's a reminder of the question. So what do you like? What do you think you could use? What might you need to tweak? Okay. So go ahead and dig in.
All right, hopefully that was enough time for you to at least skim over the lesson and get a general idea of what's it, what it is about. Um, I want to uh, share a comment Carly made in the chat. It feels liberating to be able to look at those skills and sub skills and be honest about what is going well and what I need to work on as an instructor. I hope others are feeling that way too. I agree, it's great to be in a community of supportive, um, a community of support with other instructors and say, I sometimes struggle with this. What about you, right? We're not the only ones who sometimes feel like we're not doing something as well as we could. But at the same time, everyone's able to identify those things they are doing well, which is really great. I, during, when you, when we were reviewing the lessons, I chatted out links to a couple of lesson plans from Read, Write, Think, um, that I have used to teach levels of formality. So if you have an interest in checking those out, I put the links in the chat. The second one is the one that takes an email that's got a lot of text texting abbreviations in it and they rewrite the email. Kelly writes that she likes the topic and starting simply with this idea sharing a proverb. Oh, okay. So from the diversity, equity, and inclusion, the idea that they, students might share a proverb. Um, she's got, she likes the literature part. She's lucky she has students who like literature and she might um, add some journaling. Yeah. To, for students to make connections to the proverb. She says she's got no gripes. Okay. Great. Um, Heather looked at the advanced lesson and liked that students are reading a longer passage. That passage comes from Common Lit. Yep. There are text dependent questions for them to answer and they use a graphic organizer. I could use this lesson in an online or in-person class. Mm -hmm. Oh, I might have misspoken. I can't remember if it was from Common Lit or if it came from a different source. I think, um, but yeah, we tried to include a longer text that gave students an opera from common lit thanks a chance to dig into the idea of um, being active reading and how those strategies can help them oh i'm sorry about developing a growth mindset yep getting my lessons mixed up in my brain okay good good thank you anyone else find something i hope you all found at least some small part of a lesson you might be able to use with your students so again, that's kind of what we're hoping for here. I know that um, sometimes what people say is they can't implement a whole lesson. Maybe it doesn't work with their curriculum and, and all of the competing um, priorities for what their students need to work on. But maybe there's at least an activity idea that you could bring out or a resource that you could start incorporating um, that would be helpful for building these skills. Okay, Julie says she liked the advanced lesson as it has double value to students as it affords practice to improve reading, but also could apply it in their own lives. Too often it seems they do readings for the sake of reading only. Oh, wow, yes, great. So that idea that you could really think about how, how um, there's the benefit of actually applying what you're reading, thinking about how you could use it and not just use doing it for reading practice. Mm -hmm. Wonderful comment. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to um, do an activity. We're going to practice an activity from the beginning level lesson plan. So in the independent practice section of that lesson, students do a role play. I'm calling it a role play. It's really sort of an, an information exchange activity, I guess, where students practice using circumlocation as a strategy for describing an object when they don't know the word for the object in English. Okay, so circumlocation means instead of saying the word for something, instead you describe it by saying what it's used for, where it's found, you could say what color it normally is, um, those kinds of things in order to help the other person understand the word that you have in your mind, but that you don't know. 
Okay, so I'm gonna model this activity by describing for you an object that is commonly found in your kitchen. And when you think you know what the um, object is, you're going to type it into the chat, okay? So this object is found in the kitchen. It is small enough to hold in your hand. It is a tool. You might use it when you're getting ready to prepare a meal. It has a handle and then a top part that is metal and you use it to be able to open up something that you want to eat. Yes. Yep. Good. So yes, if we go to the next slide, many of you guessed my object was a can opener. That's right. So a small object, you hold it in your hand, use it as a tool. Okay. Now I want you to start thinking about an object, okay? Maybe it's an object that you've heard your students struggle with, not knowing the name of, okay? You could use an object or depending on what kind of a class that you teach instead of, and the level of your students, instead of using an object, maybe you do a job or a chore around the, ho the house, a household chore. Maybe you do a feeling or emotion. If you were doing something around health, maybe you could describe a, a condition, a health condition or a disease. So you can think of something that would work with your students and what you teach, okay? What you're gonna do is in, in a moment or so, we're gonna send you into a breakout room and you are going to work practice describing your object to your partner or partners. And I've added some phrases here that you can use, okay? So it's used for people need this to, this is usually in, it's kind of, this thing helps people too, okay? I will say I am a little less familiar with Zoom. So when we go in our breakout rooms, I don't know if you'll still see the, the um, slide, but if you wanna take a picture of those phrases before you go in, that's what I would tell my students to do. Take a picture of those phrases on your screen so you've got it on your phone. Patsy's added the directions here. You're gonna think of the object, keep that object or activity in your mind. Don't tell your partner. You're going to get them to guess. And then once your partner has guessed, you'll switch roles. Okay. We're going to give you about five minutes in your breakout room. So if you have, um, if you both, if you and your partner both guess each other's objects very quickly, you could either try again, maybe with something more abstract the second time, or you could start a discussion of how you might be able to use this with your students, okay? Patsy also went ahead and um, typed those phrases for us. Thanks, Patsy. Okay. All right, here we go. All right, I think you were good. Okay. It's just us. <laughs> I was just, I just had what well, I was going to do. Hold on, let me, so... let me okay. stop the recording real quick. Oh, okay. <laughs> so then I can give you mine. Here you go. All right, we want to welcome you back. And I'm wondering if anyone would like to, you know, share a little bit about how did that go? Is this an activity that you could see yourself doing with your students? Do you think it would be um, something that they would be able to do and that it would be valuable for them? Um, if you want, you could just type some of your objects in the chat. There's some interest among us to know what your what people's objects or ideas were. 
But how was this? Could you see, was doing it? Could you see yourselves doing it in class? Yeah. Um, Erin says she really likes it. Thinking about how to do it online, maybe with Jamboard. Yeah, I think Jamboard might not be an option in the future, but maybe with another type of online tool. Mm -hmm. um, it was a fun warm up game. Okay, very good. That's great. Um, yeah, such a fun great. Yes. Okay. Carly did describe for us an avocado, which got uh, got guessed right away. It, Kelly's saying her students would enjoy it. Um, oh, and it forces students or it gives them an opportunity to practice using some descriptive words. They used gym, YMCA, and clock. Someone else said backpack and stapler. Okay, great, great. And one of the things I like about this activity is you could you could kind of turn it into a routine, maybe um, you know, one day a week or something, and students would get used to the routine, and then you'd be able to increase the level of um, rigor with the the things that you're describing. You know, maybe shifting from concrete objects to more like feelings or um, conditions, and if you maybe made a poster with some of this language, then your students would have that there and they get a lot of repeated experience using this. Um, Julie said she used to do this in class. She put objects in paper lunch bags. One partner could look at it and feel it. And then they had to use phrases to get their partner to say it. Mm -hmm. Um, Amanda says it's a nice low stakes way. Yes. So there's not really any problem if you don't guess it in class or if you don't get it right in class. And then it's a low stakes way to build up your confidence to do it maybe at work or at school or at the doctor's office in some of those real world scenarios. Oh, yep. And then it's a way for students to ask questions while also practicing those skills. Yep. Um, and Heather's, yeah, I have, I have also done the paper lunch bag. Okay. Very good. Wonderful. Thank you all for trying that out with us. Okay. We've kind of skipped ahead to this where we've talked about the making it our own. So we'll talk, we'll get into our last category for today, which is critical thinking. If we go to the next slide. Okay. So critical thinking requires disciplined thinking that is open-minded, rational, and informed by evidence in order to arrive at decisions or conclusions that go beyond factual recall. In ABE classrooms, critical thinking skills involve actively applying thinking strategies that range from analyzing relationships between components to drawing conclusions from a variety of data. Critical thinking skills are increasingly essential for ABE learners to succeed in the workplace, higher ed, and in navigating the complexities of 21st century life. So if we look at the specific skills, we've got organize, analyze, and illustrate relationships between components, items, and ideas. Then we've got solve problems, use information to draw conclusions and make decisions, and then recognize bias, assumptions, and multiple perspectives are our four main skills. And on our next slide, here is the full list, skills and subskills. And let's take just a moment, let's see if we can pick out any of these that we're doing well and things that might need more attention. I'm gonna take a look myself here.
So Carly says she knows she could do more with all of skill four, so that recognizing bias and assumptions. In my reading class, one of our um, one of our benchmarks is to talk about those types of things. I think I need to do more with three C. Um, when we talk about evaluating evidence or information, which gets into evidence. Mm -hmm. And Kelly says she's doing well with all of skill three and she needs to work more on skill four. Okay, great. All right. Skill four is important. Yep. Amanda's got a couple. She's doing well with 2A, articulating the parts of a problem more work needed with identify. Yeah, so you can maybe get to what is the problem, not so much about how do we go about solving the problem. Okay, good. All right, let's go ahead. We're gonna dig in our three lessons for critical thinking. The beginning, it has to do with map reading and prepositions of place is the beginning level lesson. The intermediate level lesson is about map reading and then route planning, okay? And then for the third, uh, the advanced level, the third lesson, it's about using problem solving skills to address a public, trans public transportation issues, okay? So go ahead and click on that link that um, Patsy chatted out. You'll come to the Google folder, pick the lesson that works with you and your students. I think we're gonna just, we're gonna spend about three minutes this time. So look at that lesson, skim it for your big picture impressions, okay? All right. So Kelly, thank you for bringing us back to start talking about our likes here. Um, Kelly, what did you, which did you look at the advanced level? 
Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, so she says the topic is relevant, especially to real daily life. So the topic, the students read an article from the Minnesota Daily, actually, which is the student newspaper at the University of Minnesota, about um, how they kind of feel about uh, riding the light rail. And then they look at some data that we're going to look at around um, sort of statistics about light rails and how safe or dangerous light rail systems are or public transportation systems are in various cities. Um, it includes a quick write. She likes that. Could be fun as an additional lesson. Oh, not on the same day. A field trip in the summer to ride our public transit and analyze it. Yeah, that would be great to get students to kind of um, take a ride and, and think about whether or not they agree, specific things they might agree or disagree with that were brought up in the article. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. Heather looked at the advanced lesson. I think this could also include what questions do you want to ask, such as the populations of the cities, how many miles of light rail? Yes, so it could maybe be, um, something that you used as an extension, kind of the lesson could lead into an extension research project maybe to look more at public transportation in the Twin Cities or across Minnesota um, that even sort of some numeracy work maybe um, could be brought in using answering some of those questions. Great, great, great. Okay, so Speaking about the advanced lesson, so we're gonna look at the advanced lesson. Again, this comes from the introduction section. Students look at three graphs related to safety and public transportation. They look at each graph and practice making true statements about the information it contains. So a variation on this is instead of making statements, they can sometimes write questions. Um, about the information in the graph, but I also sometimes have my students write true statements. And I do wanna share the graphs in this lesson come from a November, 2022 article on the American Experiment website. It seems like the author was using government data, but at the same time, I just wanna be clear, the graphs are included to provide students with visual literacy practice. The views expressed in the article are those of the author. And although I did a tiny bit of digging in to make sure it wasn't from a highly unreliable source, it's not been thoroughly verified. So I, you know, I would I think it's important to point out to our students where this information comes from and to bring up that um, there could be other information out there on the same topic that could even contradict this information. So if we go to the next slide, you look at the graph. So this graph is light rail personal security events per billion passenger miles. Um, the red line is here in Minnesota, that's Metro Transit, and the blue line is the national average. I will say one of the things that made me more comfortable about including these was that it does say the force, the, excuse me, the source was the Federal Transit Administration. So I felt like there was some reliable source information here. Um, so let's look at these, this graph, and let's practice writing a true statement about the information in the graph. Anyone, let's see. Oh yes, Heather, Heather always takes a good idea and makes it just a, just better. Maybe I could add, write two facts from the graphs and two opinions from the graphs. Some students struggle with fact and opinion. Yeah, or maybe um, a fact from the graph and an opinion from the article, something like that. Mm-hmm. Does anyone want to take a, a crack at writing something that they think is a true statement based on this graph or a statement that could be supported with evidence from the graph? Might be a more academic way of phrasing that. 
Fact, this graph covers seven years. Excellent. There were more security events in 2020 than in 2014. Yes, it, it, on Metro Transit, I think in particular, that's clear. Yes, yes, good. So I often do this type of activity with my students. I'll show them some sort of graph, graph or chart or map and ask them to engage in it. What, what's a true statement you could make, right? Or sometimes I'll give them language like, could you make a statement using more or less or fewer um, or greater than or less than? So they're kind of practicing with those types of academic structures. Um, so I just wanted to say you could do this kind of an activity as a routine of writing statements or questions or comparisons using any sort of graph or chart. It certainly wouldn't have to be about public transportation. Amanda said security events on Met Metro Transit began dramatically increasing in 2018. Yes, very good. Um, and the reason I think this is a useful activity is because it gets students engaged and and sometimes I think our students look at graphs and they're not really sure what you're supposed to make of them or how to interpret them. So it's a way of kind of starting a conversation about doing that work. Metro transit riders have experienced more security events than are experienced on average in the United States. Absolutely, yes. All right, good. So because it's getting close to our end time, I'm going to say, um, Maybe you can think for your think on your own, reflect on your own, how you might be able to use this activity with your students. I've already kind of said you can do it with any type of graph or chart. Okay. If we go to the next slide, once again, you don't have to teach an entire ACES lesson into in order to begin developing or continue developing these skills with your learners. Each of these lesson example plans contains activities that can be mined to find the nuggets of gold that will work with your learners. Okay, so thank you so much for having me with you today. And Carly is going to close us out. Sure, yeah, I wanna thank um, all the participants here. This was a really engaging, um, discussion that we had in the chat and with Stephanie, and I want to thank her for presenting. Um, we'd love to hear any feedback that you have from um, today's webinar, just because we are planning um, the next half of this. We're going to tackle the last three categories with ACES TIFF in a webinar on February 15th same um, type of time, 1 to 2.30, it's on a Thursday, and feel free to register for that event as well. We would love to see you there. And then I also want to point out that registration is open for Language and Literacy, which is a virtual conference, and it's happening on a Thursday and Friday, January 25th and 26th at the end of this month. We've already had over 100 people register, and this is the largest Atlas professional development event um, in the year. So we would love to see you there as well. I'm seeing some information in the chat that Patsy shared. Thank you. Yeah, let me know if anyone has any questions. Um, it's going to be a great event. There's more information on the website as far as the schedule and the keynote um, addresses each morning and such. And Stephanie's presenting at Language and Literacy, yes, too. <laughs> as well as others who will remain anonymous on this call as well. So, Julie has a message in the chat here. I always included the question, what is the source of this information whenever I used a graph in class to get students used to looking for that to make sure it's legit? Yeah, now more than ever information that um, ourselves and our students are bombarded with, we have to kind of question where is it coming from. Um, last announcement here is a save the date for the Adult Career Pathway Institute. This is going to be a half 
day virtual event that's on Friday, April 19th. And if you work with Adult Career Pathways or are interested in incorporating that more into your program, this is going to be a great event coming up this spring. And otherwise, we just want to thank you for being here this afternoon and sharing so many great ideas. I know I was really energized by what um, everyone shared. And we will send out the recording, the slides, and an evaluation um, in the next day or two. And then it's when you fill out the evaluation for the webinar that you'll have access to the CEUs. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Stephanie and Carly, for making this happen. Much appreciated.